All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our sixth Fluorescent Friday event. My name is Dr. Lina Cárdenas, and I'll be your host. I am an assistant professor at the School of Design at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. The Inter-Society Color Council created Fluorescent Fridays as a platform for international university students across disciplines to network with color professionals and share state-of-the-art research with each other. Our goal is to build a global student chapter that positions color as a multidisciplinary STEM model, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and provides up-to-date color research by scientists, artists, designers, industry professionals, and university students. If you're interested in getting involved, check our website for more information and learn and learn about the benefits of becoming a member. We would love to have you join us. Today, today's event is Hitting the Sweet Spot with Color, presenting the Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, this presentation would include an overview of the Graphics Communication Management Department at Toronto Metropolitan University, a faculty research study on an expanding printing gamut, and a presentation on reimagining re Nestle Turtles holiday gift packages. Get your questions ready for our Q&A session after the presentation. Please write your questions in the chat box so the panel can answer your questions after the presentation. Okay, so we're... You're muted, Lena. Okay, sorry. Apparently when... It is my pleasure to introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Martin Havacost, Chair of the School of Graphic Communications Management at Toronto Metropolitan University. Dr. Havacost teaches courses in press, printing technologies, and introductory, introductory pre-media. He's active in the Technical Association of the Graphics Art, TAGA, and started as a student chapter at Ryerson in 2006. He also promoted international exchange activities at the school with exchange partners in Belgium, Denmark, Germany, South Korea, and Sweden. His research interests are in the areas of color measurement, color differencing equations, paper topography, and its influence on print quality and expanded gamut printing. Dr. Martin Havacos, the screen is yours. Thank you, Lena, for this introduction. All right, let me share my screen here. Um, there it is, all right. You can all see this? Perfect. Thank you. All right, so welcome to the School of Graphic Communications Management at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly known as Ryerson University. This name change just happened on Wednesday, so it is brand new. One thing the university did, they kept the font, they kept the colors, the name changed. All right, so welcome to our program and I will give you an introduction first a bit about Toronto itself if you haven't been to this city here. So here you see in the background our city hall, the curved building, two curved buildings is the city hall of Toronto. Toronto is the largest city in Canada with a population of roughly 2.9 million inhabitants. The greater Toronto area is about 7 million people. And it's called the most diverse city in the world by BBC Radio with over 230 different nationalities and many amazing food options. And according to The Economist, it's one of the, in the top 10 most livable cities in the world. A little bit about Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, we are located in the heart of downtown Toronto. Uh, we are the most applied to university in Ontario, the province or state, if it's more familiar for you. 
relative to available space, we have approximately 44,000 students, 120 plus undergraduate and graduate programs, 133 partner universities in over 37 countries and 125 uh, research institutes and labs. Here you see some pictures uh, of the campus. We have here the uh, Image Arts Building where you see the pictures here of Andy Warhol and Martin Luther King and Ingrid Bergman. And in front of the building is a artificial lake, which uh, is used in the winter to cool your, in the summer to cool your feet and in the winter to go skating and play hockey. And sometimes you see also figure skaters from the university practice on there. <laughs> and the middle is the so-called quad, the quadratic uh, uh, green space within the university. And on the right, you see our student learning center, which is gave uh, our university a um, spot on Young Street, the main street in Toronto. So a little bit about our program, graphic communications management. So as you probably know, quality uh, published material for web or print requires important education. And we teach courses, not only in graphic design and typography, packaging, workflow management, entrepreneurship, and management skills. And this is just a few that we offer here. We are the only bachelor's degree pro program in this field in Canada with approximately 700 students and 28 uh, faculty uh, members. and. Before COVID, we had small class sizes and hands-on lab courses to help students build personal connections with instructors and their peers. Our program rests on three pillars, design and creativity, technology and innovation, and business and entrepreneurship. So every time when somebody says, well, what's graphic communications management? Um, people will say, yeah, you need about half an hour to explain what we do. So some highlights about our program, our students take a paid internship uh, in year three. We offer international opportunities. Lena already alluded to them in the introduction. We have a very high job placement rate. Uh, we offer entrance scholarships, not only from the university, but also supported by uh, industry. We have a very diverse uh, course options and small classes. International opportunities include also courses in uh, 3D printing at uh, one of our partner universities in, in Europe. And um, yeah, that's one of the international opportunities. So when somebody says, a student says, or a prospective student says, well, what can I do afterwards? Well, here's a list of possible job opportunities that you can take after taking our program. So I don't want to read them all to you. You can uh, look over this. There's uh, many different uh, options here of jobs that students take after graduation. We offer also four uh, concentrations in our program. One is called in packaging, one in publishing, digital graphic output, and in leadership. And the most popular uh, minor that our students take is marketing. Others that uh, are available to our students are, for example, finance, law, fashion, environmental, and urban sustainability. But the most popular one at the moment is marketing. So here's our uh, course uh, schedule that the students are taking. All those ones that have a red, little red box around them is where uh, color is uh, taught. It starts in the first semester in DCM 120 where students uh, create a so-called campaign and they have to choose a Pantone color that goes with their campaign. They have to mix the can Pantone color uh, with offset inks and print it uh, on our small color offset machine. And uh, it's interesting to see how they interact with the ink and sometimes they are covered up to their elbows in ink when they do that. Um, and then in the material science, uh, course uh, students uh, evaluate the differences between print processes, in our case, offset, flexible, and digital, and evaluate the color capabilities of these print processes. And in year three, we have the color management course, GCM 360, um, where the students get really deep into color, color management, ICC profiling, using different management uh, measurement uh, options um, for evaluating color and building uh, ICC profiles. Now a little look into our labs. I hope I stay within the time here. 
we have a pre-media lab with also here a little photography studio option. Uh, we have two Mac labs um, with Adobe Creative Suite and other um, and as software like ICC, uh, i1 profiler and, and other software um, that students are exposed to. We have here uh, state-of-the-art Epson proofers with uh, in built-in color control, uh, in spectrophotometer uh, to calibrate the, uh, the, the proofers. And we have here at the bottom right, you see here our uh, plate making capabilities for flexo and offset plates. Um, we have then a bindery lab where students can learn also about the finishing um, capabilities that we have here and the finishing pro processes that need to happen. And here just some examples of some manual book binding that students uh, did uh, in the past. And uh, we use mostly x write exact machines for measuring color. And we have also have here a white format uh, inkjet printer where students also learn how to make sure that the color is accurately reproduced. And we also can, of course, use the white format inkjet printer here for t-shirt making. So here's an example of some students showing the t-shirts to make together with their instructor, Dr. Sharma. And here's a quick look into our uh, press lab. We have now a seven color. This is a bit of an older picture. It was only four color flexo press, now seven colors. Uh, a four color offset press with perfecting capabilities. Um, and one of the concentration is regards to publishing. So the Right Tiger student chapter that uh, Lena uh, alluded to in the beginning that I'm the advisor to is putting out a journal every year and competes for the Helmut Kippen Cup. Um, so this is some of the publications that are being done and a little bit about student life. Uh, we managed to stay connected uh, also during the pandemic. We had virtual events with uh, guest speakers and social nights offered by our student union as a game night, movie nights, um, fluorescent Fridays for students to also learn about uh, other things that happen in um, the world of, of color and in introduction. Oh, they see also our new social media handle down there, GCM TMU. Um, is now our new, used to be RUGCM, so it's now GCMTMU. Uh, we put together course packs uh, for students to have a hands-on experience at home. What versus things you also see here, the uh, GCM uh, Nestle cooperation that uh, Donna and her students would talk to, uh, talk about shortly. Thank you for uh, listening to me, uh, if you want to follow us on any of the social media uh, channels, the handle is GCMTMU. You can contact us as a GCM admin at stillryerson.ca that will be changed later on. So we still have a bit of a mix up of the names at the moment. So thank you everybody for uh, listening to my presentation and I hope you got a bit interested in what we do here at Ryerson University. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, please don't forget to let us know um, where you're from, so we can have uh, we can see where, where people are joining us from uh, for the presentations. And if you have questions, please write them write them down in our chat box. Okay, so. Our next speaker is Dr. Reem Ella Sally, an associate professor in graphic communications management at the Creative School at Toronto Metropolitan University. She's a member of the university graduate studies under the Masters of the Digital Media Program. Her area of academic interest is in color and imaging science, Emergency premedia emerging. I'm sorry, emerging premedia technologies and digital assets, asset management. Currently, she's developing a systematic review on the impact of implementing integrated technologies in the graphic art industry over the past ten years. Dr. Ring, welcome to Fluorescent Friday. Thank you so much. 
So I'm gonna start with sharing my screen. So what I'm going to present to you today is an example of a kind of research that we do at TMU. So our research is talking about accuracy of spot color reproduction in Southern Color Expanded Gamma Flexographic Printing. And this research was in a collaborating between myself, Dr. Habikas, and Dr. Sharma. Yeah. So let's set just a little bit of a background. Now, full color printing is typically done using a process color ink, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Extend, expanded gamut printing involve adding three more colors, the orange, the green, and violet, to the process colors to expand the gamut of a printing process. Thus, achieving more spot color reproduction using the combination of these process color set without the need of the actual spot color in the printing unit. Therefore, this is going to improve the production efficiency with less ink and material use, less make ready, makeup ready time on the press and more press capacity. Using CMYK can actually produce millions of colors, but not all of them. In these cases, we need to add some ink. This is called the spot colors. Brands, they are using spot colors either to protect their identity, brand identity, or to print colors that the CMYK cannot reproduce, like neon pink or sulfur, or to save money on two color job. The objective of this study was to get a better understanding on characterizing a press for expanded gamut printing. We selected the flexographic printing, because it has been dominating the packaging industry for a decade due to its economical and fast process, the ability to print on wide variety of substrate materials, such as corrugated cardboard, label stock, and metallic film, and minimal breakdowns and low maintenance costs. As a flexography, continues to develop methods and approaches to improve its productivity and quality. The challenge to overcome issues related to reducing costs, decreasing make ready time and consistent reproduction spot colors become really the new reality of many companies. Implementing expanded gamma technology would really help resolve the challenges. The Pantone spot colors that you see here is a standardized color matching system, which is a widely used around the world. And it was advised to help apprentice to and designer to specify and control colors for the printing project. In this uh, new study, we use Comco Cadet Flexo Label Press and evaluated the accuracy of two color management system. ESCO Equinox and GMG Open Color in the reproduction of 27 well distributed spot colors from the Pantone Plus Solid Coated Library on Extra Plus LTR label stock. What's so exciting about this project is that we're using our own Flexo Press that is installed at our school, which we also use in many lab based courses to teach about the conventional printing. The press is manually controlled press as an opposed to what is actually available in the industry with the magic buttons. At our school, we use the magic power of our press operator. And in this case, and in this research, it was Professor Habikas who has the magic power to manually adjust the plates and control the press. We believe that this would enhance the learning experience of our student once they learn the fundamental of how the press is actually operated. So let's dig into the experimental uh, overview. So we base that, we base our research on the fundamental of color management. Color management actually ensure uh, the consistent color over of image graphics across different media and devices, such as uh, and application like book, magazine, computers, and smartphone. We consider the process of color managing a flexo printing process in four stages. Press optimization, as you can see here on the uh, left side, where you set press variables such as printed intensity, the plate LPI, 
Then the next step would be the curve calibration, where you set a curve strategy that contain the individual pump or cutback curve for each of the seven colors so the gray balance can achieve. Then the next two steps, which is the color characterization and verification, which I'm gonna discuss in a second. The characterization step or run is the most important step in achieving a good color management. Because in this step, we are measuring the device color characteristics or gamut. Or in pure English, we are actually trying to determine how many colors this flexible graphics produce using our selected ink and substrate. This would be achieved by using a special test chart that would then be measured to calculate the ink buildup for the colors of the Pantone Plus solid coated library, which is what we are trying to reproduce using the extended gamut uh, in this project. We have noted that the color management process relies on characterization chart as used to determine the color characteristics of the printing process. The number and the choice of color patches in expanded ca gamut characterization test chart is still in work of progress, and there is no standardized extended, uh, uh, extended color gamut uh, test chart used in CMYK printing. So in this project, we tested the property uh, chart from ESCO and GMG and non-property uh, test chart from Idea Lines. The ESCO Equinox solution has a really unique ap approach that is different uh, to any other solution on the market, is that it has a very large number of patches, which is created in a separate press form. The chart, therefore, was printed on a different part of the media roll and in a separated press run. GMG and Idea Alliance, both of them, they have one test shot that can be printed on one single press run. This slide visualizes how the three characterization target will be processed by the two expanded gamut workflow to determine the build of the selected Pantone colors shown in the custom test shot in your right hand side of the slide. The measurement of from ESCO press run are then incorporated in the software color pilot. The GMG test uh, chart measured using built in measurement tools and open colors. And then the idea lines, which is the last one, test chart was read in both ESCO Color Pilot and GMG open color software. Using the calculated ink built for all of the Pantone Plus solid coated library we got from the ESCO Color Pilot program we try to select 27 test, uh, test colors with color difference between the target Pantone colors and uh, the estimated build up by about of one, which is really great indication that we are going to get a good match when we print and, dis and distribute uh, and when we print. And these are 27 colors, we're trying to select it so that it's going to be distributed as evenly as possible around the color wheel. The test chart was then processed using the characterization data collected from the previous press run. You can see clearly in, uh, in the slide which characterization uh, chart data was used to process the custom verification test target. On this slide, you're gonna see uh, the images from the verification press run. Uh, the research was took place during the pandemic, and uh, uh, and as you can see, you have face mask in there. I was the person behind the camera, and you can see here um, our uh, magical Professor Happycast uh, dealing with the press with the help of Professor Sharma. Okay, so I'm going to present uh, two of uh, the uh, results that we got. Um, since this is a really manual operated press, we are expecting some variation between the characterization run and the final run. So we would like to take this into our consideration before actually digging into more analysis. So we collected a density measurement from the SID patches from both sides of the uh, uh, target, the left and right. We measure that using the exact color and we use implement a, um, a formula to calculate the press variation. 
In this graph, the dark blue bar or green bar indicate the target ink density that we're trying to achieve. Next, the light blue bars indicate the average solid ink density measurement taken from ESCO characterization press run. The light green bar from for GMG characterization press run, the orange bar from ideal lines characterization press run, and finally the red bar is going to indicate the value that we got from the final uh, verification run. What we're hoping to see is now is that we don't want to see as many variation between all the press run for the tester color which is we almost achieved except for the green and, and violet. And you can see the huge difference between the target and the verification and the other press run. What you're also going to notice is that there is a, sol a similarity on solid ink density between the GMG and uh, the idealized idea lines characterization run, which is indicated by the green and orange bar. The second test is to calculate the color difference between the target color and the actual printed color. We do that by using color difference or Delta E2000 formula. In this formula, the lower the number, the more accurate the printed color from the target or what we're trying to achieve. So we have two graphs in this slide that show the delta E value of these 27 test color in comparison to the Pantan plus solid coated reference value. Again, the lower the number reflect a better matching. The top left graph show the measurement of the tested patches that was processed using ESCO probability data, which is represented by the blue bars over and at the idea alliance, which is represented by the orange uh, bar. As you can see, overall, delta E value are smaller for the ink that built up drive from ESCO as opposed than at the idea alliance. On this one, the same thing you can see between the GMG, which is represented by the yellow bars, as opposed to the idea alliance, which is represented by the green, uh, green bar. Also overall GMG uh, uh, achieve a better matching when it's using its property data over non-property idea line. Also, as you can see, Delta E value on GMG target are smaller than those seen in ESCO uh, chart. As a conclusion, so we have successfully uh, run an experiment using a manually controlled Flexopress. Both vendors did really overall a better um, result with their own target as an opposed to a DIA line. And we were able to cover 60, 65% of the Pantan uh, plus solid coated book with equipment that is used to this study. This research was uh, published in multiple platforms. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us if you want to get more information. There is a more result that we also share in, uh, in there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reem, for that lovely presentation. Our next speakers are Donna Rasik, Cassandra Pascucci, and Cameron Garza. I wanna start with Donna. Donna is an award-winning instructor in the School of Graphic Communications Management at Toronto Metropolitan University. Donna is a leader in print innovation and a technical packaging specialist with over 20 years of commercialization experience. Her work at the university supports the packaging concentration courses and other foundation curricula. She focuses on the experiential learning journey for her students and incorporates industry challenges into her courses. Cassandra, Pascucci is a four-year graphic communication management student at Toronto Metropolitan University with a minor in communication design and a concentration in packaging. She's an organized, hardworking creative with a knack for packaging and sustainability, having participated in various competitions throughout her undergraduate career. Cameron is also a four-year graphic communications management student 
at, at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University with a concentration in packaging. He is a self-driven designer with an interest in graphic design for packaging and a strong interest in 3D modeling and product rendering for package. Donna, Cassandra, and Cameron, welcome to Fluorescent Fridays. Thank you, Lena, and thank you um, to the ISCC for having us here today. So first, let me start by sharing um, that at GCM, there's a package prototyping course called Out of the Box. We starting from the design concept to actual fabrication of a prototype, this course explores all the necessary steps taken before we commercialize a packaged good. And what better way to learn those strategies than to work with an actual global brand? And then of course, you throw in chocolate and the fact that the brand shared uh, multiple product samples with all of our students before we started, and that certainly created a bit of interest. So let me first share some of the concepts that drive the thinking and insights in package development, and then you will hear directly from a few of our students who worked on this exciting project with Nestle Canada, putting these methodologies to the test. So there are two major components in packaging design. So Cam, you want to Oh, there we go. The first is uh, the structure, and that considers fit, form, and function. So how does a package carry a product? How does it carry it safely and arrive safely to the consumer? And then how does a consumer interact and experience that packaged format? And then the second concept is the graphical component, and that connects the brand identity and the information on the shape that holds the product. Now, when you arrive at your local shopping environments, there are two guiding principles that are leading you towards a purchase decision. And versus, you know, Canada versus the US, the US has 10 times the greater uh, choice selection and brand uh, available in their retail environments. And these two guiding principles leading us is uh, towards that purchase decision is findability. So looking for brands that you are loyal to and then shopability. So those are the brands that you're looking to explore and discover with. The brand owner's objective in a package is to capture the brand essence that will impact the consumer purchase decision. So the package acts basically as a salesperson for the product within. And when consumers are shopping in a very busy aisle and cluttered area like you just saw before, the eye is first drawn to color. And that's then followed by shape of the package, which you see here, and then followed by a message or a message in the bottle. So these factors also correlate to the distance that the shopper is to the packaged product. And all of this process happens in mere seconds. So these three appearance factors are linked to psychographic connections with colors and words and texture that can strategically impact the, the conversion to sale and then also to create that repeat purchase. It will also validate if a brand truly understands their target market, deciding on what choices they make in their packaging design. So last winter, this course partnered with Nestle Canada to reimagine the Nestle Turtles holiday chocolate gift packaging. A competition ensued whereby the top three placed groups were celebrated with financial prize winnings, and then obviously more opportunities have arisen since. So as part of this course curriculum and project deliverables, I guided our students in uh, innovating and iterating a high fidelity prototype package solution that incorporated a structural design, um, 3D CAD drawings, 3D renders, and printed prototypes. Students were asked to analyze, evaluate, and incorporate full life cycle thinking, including manufacturing and distribution considerations, and of course, share their learning journey across this entire proposal, so that they touched each stage in the packaging value chain. But not only were students asked to innovate the form, they were also challenged to amplify Nestle's holiday packaging with creative design strategy that met the brand and the consumer objectives. Students use technologies and equipment made available at the school to deliver physical and digital uh, prototypes that really allowed them to um, bring their original designs to life. So I, of course, felt that all my entire 77 students were winners. So I handed that off to Nestle for them to choose the top three. 
And we're lucky today to have our uh, two students from our first place team. Uh, so you've got Cam and Cassandra, who will speak to their learning journey with this project and how critical color and branding was in their pursuit of first place. And before I pass it off to them, I just want to share some of the comments that Nestle made as to why they chose um, their package system as first place. So they felt that this team really took a bold approach to reinvent the design altogether and brought a very strong element of presentation and giftability. They integrated end-to-end -end thinking, covering all packaging aspects within all of the systems, so primary, secondary, and tertiary packaging, and that the rationale of the choices of materials, manufacturing, and distribution were complete. So without further ado, let me pass it off to um, Cam and Cassandra to speak further. Thank you, Donna. So I'm Cassandra. And I'm Cam, and we're part of the winning, uh, winning team of the Nestle Student Packaging Redesign Competition. We hire the packaging prototyping class hosted by, as you know, Donna. So Nestle Turtles wanted us to redesign their packaging system to make it more recyclable, accessible, and better sized to contain the products, while maintaining their branding so the product was still recognizable um, on store shelves. So our job was to innovate and redesign the Nestle Turtle brand packaging while keeping it traditional and recognizable. So let's see how we did. First, we're just going to speak to the brand a little bit. So Nestle is a food and drink corporation that has been producing Turtles chocolate since 1949. It is a cherished Canadian chocolate that is largely gifted during the holiday season to loved ones, friends, and family. They have a goal of 100% recyclable packaging by 2025 as part of their sustainability initiative. So creating a packaging that was recyclable was also something we had to keep in mind. Their current packaging system consists of plastic wrappers with stripes and orange and brown colors for their primary packaging and a tall flat box as their secondary packaging with the same stripes and colors. With this and the brief guidelines in mind, our team started thinking of designs that could, be, that could possibly be the future of Nestle Turtles. We wanted to bring in a new design language while sticking to the traditional design. But as you'll see in our many iterations up next, we may have gone too far off the branding and the easily identifiable colors of Nestle Turtles in the beginning of our ideation process. So now about the brief uh, quickly. Um, so the project brief asked for a new holiday branded package to be sold and enjoyed during the holiday season. So with this, Nestle gave us a list of criteria that we had to keep in mind during the ideation process. So first they wanted the package to show off and amplify the sharing and giftability aspects of the turtle brand while having it be both sustainable and accessible. Uh, Nestle also wanted a package that would be neutral on its cost of production, so not cost more than its cost of production for its current packaging right now, while addressing the fit and function for holding the chocolates. So at the moment, they feel that their chocolates are too loose in the current packaging format, and that the box is manually folded, so they want to try and automate that. And lastly, and most importantly, they wanted us to leverage and stick to with the iconic colors and design language of Turtles chocolate. Now for the iteration process. So as you can see here, we have a multitude of different primary packaging ideations as an attempt to improve the original design by making it more festive and changing some of the colors around for a fresh new look. Clearly, we didn't have a specific design in mind, which made an impact on the color and design choices we made along the way. As you can see, it's a little bit all over the place, um, but we knew early on, <laughs> thankfully, that we had to keep the orange and white stripes and Turtles logo intact for the design of the primary packaging, but we wanted to try adapting the orange with uh, the introduction of colors to complement it and use of different design patterns to change it up from the normal stripes. So now on to the secondary packaging design iterations. So for this, we also changed the secondary packaging design by getting rid of the stripes and playing around with the colors and shape of the box, as well as introducing a more sort of retro design, which you can see on the right. Uh, we tried to challenge the usual stripe orientation by making it both horizontal or vertical or getting rid of it entirely, which you can see in both of our early design iterations here. Um, for the one on the left, we tried adding a green garland around the front of the box to help um, make it more festive. However, adding in another color to the brand was not great for the brand image. Uh, once again, we wanted to try and push and overhaul the term design, which we soon found out wasn't necessarily what the client wanted. So once we presented these to Nest the Nestle representatives, they weren't totally thrilled about it and gave us some tips for improvement. So they said that our design swayed a bit too far away from the original branding especially with the iconic orange and the white stripes. And then it would no longer be a recognizable product on store shelves. So they recommended that we maintain the stripes and the original brand colors to help with the brand image and recognizability, 
since it's a huge global brand. Uh, so with this feedback, we went back to the drawing board and produced their final packaging system. So here you can see the final primary and secondary packages alongside the current turtles packaging. The meeting we had with Nestle representatives was very beneficial to us for our final design as they helped align us with the brand image and come to a final design. With this push to rethink and return to the more traditional design in mind, the team got to work to understand what makes the Turtles brand tick, what were its characteristics, and try and innovate, and innovate off of that. The important takeaway from our meeting with the Nestle marketing team was the importance of color and design and how it goes hand in hand with brand identity with brand identity and recognizability on store shelves. So now on to answering the brief. So the final packaging system we came up with. Uh, so our final design adhered with Nestle Turtles uh, branding and we learned the importance of marketability and recognizability in a design sense on store shelves with the use of recognizable color traits for the Turtles brand. So the design maintains the iconic Turtles orange and white stripes with brown and gold features alongside with it. So we replaced the original green garland around the window with a gold frame to highlight the turtles while maintaining their brand colors. Um, with this, we were still able to add the same emphasis, but keep a consistent recognizable brand by sticking with the same colors for a more cohesive and recognizable design. So this is why color is so important, especially when working with a global brand such as Nestle, because it helps retain the image of the brand so consumers know what they're looking at while shopping in the stores, but it also helps add a new fresh look to draw the product to the attention of shoppers. So in terms of our primary package, um, we use the iconic stripe design to wrap around each individual chocolate while using the new colors to help differentiate between the three chocolate flavors. So you can see that on the right side. Um, so in the end, we did get the opportunity to help try and innovate and introduce new aspects while keeping the traditional design iconography intact. So in terms of the other criteria mentioned for the product brief that we mentioned earlier, we introduced a new primary package, which is a twist design to help push the giftability and shareability aspect of the product while also adding to the presentation alongside with the new opening mechanism, which you can see on the left in the vendor right there. Uh, we also ensured sustainability throughout the entire package with the main structure being uh, completely paper foil based and the individual wrappers of each chocolate being a recyclable plastic. Uh, and lastly, the easy to open mechanism, uh, tab mechanism also ensures it is easily accessible and openable for any consumers. So we kept the accessibility in mind. And here you can see our final prototype, so during our course, we were able to prototype our designs throughout our ideation process to see how our designs would translate into a physical printed product. Having a color accurate and printed prototype truly aided us in accurately expressing our idea to the brand representatives and helped put us on the right track to creating the perfect package. This is an important step in any design process to see how well the colors translate from computer to print and to see how cohesive the final packaging system looks and how consumers will perceive it. So now on to the key takeaways. So obviously your first idea isn't always your last. And as you can see, your team explored dozens of iterations until one final design you made. So the phrase is not always about, uh, it's not about the destination, but rather the journey really positively impacted our team. From the endless iterations you saw in the previous slides, we aim to continuously improve our existing design to maintain the Turtles brand image while putting a fresh new spin on it to catch the eyes of consumers. So we also learned the importance of color, especially when dealing with a, ma any, with a major brand like this, and how even the slice changes can have a huge impact on the consumer perception of the brand. So even the simple green garland to make the package more festive can impact the way people perceive the brand and orientation and changing the orientation of the stripes as well. So we also have a great appreciation for feedback and getting an outside perspective on the project. Our critique with Nestle representatives really helped us understand and get an idea of how our design would be perceived and how we can improve and see where we have to go to make a successful package. So our main takeaways were the importance of brand coherence and adherence. So this includes color, iconography, and especially in this case, nostalgia of the messaging and the brand itself, communication, and the importance of the iterations and prototyping that we did during this whole process. So thank you so much for listening and you can feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn and if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation, Donna, Cassandra, and Cameron. Now, um, we'll go for the questions uh, from our, for our panel. Um, 
So Lena, we have two questions. Okay. To start. The first question is for the students. It's from John Seymour. And he says, it looks like Nestle's was pretty strict about choice of colors, but you were allowed to add yellow. How much leeway do you have for colors? Um, so yeah, from the get-go, they were pretty uh, strict about the colors. Obviously, you can see we tried to kind of push the push the threshold a bit with the green and that was a little too strong for them. Mm -hmm. But they were pretty okay because um, in some of the other packaging, especially older ones, they did have some introduction of gold. So for us, it's, it's less of a yellow and more of like a faux gold look to it. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of already a part of their brand image. So it wasn't so much of a push. It was just kind of a reintroduction of something they have uh, implemented beforehand, basically. Uh, um, to the students or to Donna, do you know how Nestle's originally selected their colors? It was a great question, and um, I I don't actually have that answer. Um, I'm I, certainly being back since 1949. I would love to have been you know part of that brand focus group uh, deciding on on what uh, was out there. Um, certainly, when it comes to brand colors, you're you're connecting to what exists in your competitive set, um, and then what represents a category. So it doesn't surprise me that um, browns and you know uh, were part of their color stream. And then when you think about iconography and kind of brand ownability, um, obviously. Obviously, the, the orange is what they kind of chose for their for their branding, but it's a fantastic question and um, I'd be happy to take that away and and see if I can uh, push to understand the answer if they have that that history and I'm sure they do. For the students, uh, what did you like most about doing this product project? What was your most valuable lesson? Uh, so for me personally, I was uh, the guy who did like the 3D rendering and like the, the structure design. So I was really into that stuff. That's kind of what I want to try and get into. Um, I don't know, what, what was your favorite? I think being able to prototype and see how our idea can like come to life. That was really something that was really important to me because we got, it really helped us uh, in creating our final design. Another question similar to that is, did this project help you decide on what you want your future career to be? Yes, definitely for myself, because uh, I was like kind of dipping in the 3D stuff beforehand and this kind of like pushed me to actually give it a shot. And it, it made me realize I'm re I really like doing that. So definitely, yeah, for myself, yeah. Yeah, and for yes. me as well, sorry. No, go ahead, Cassandra, go ahead. It really helped me understand that I wanted to go into something to deal with packaging because I really un like understanding the whole packaging process and design. And I was just going to say, if, if someone does sync with Cameron, you'll see that he posts on LinkedIn every week, his latest yeah. structural <laughs> rendered that he's playing yeah. around with. So you can see his journey on how he's growing in his, in his art and ex expertise. So Thank follow you, him. Thank you, Donna, for the shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> so a question for Donna, what is the importance in color trends in branding? Um, significantly for two, two reasons. One is um, brands can uh, take a risky strategy to align with potentially a fad that um, if, and again, it depends on their, their strength of legacy. So when you're talking about a brand that's been around since 1949, for them to make significant shifts like moving into, you know, drawing in a color like green, um, it does risk that recognizability. And as I spoke to at the beginning around findability and shopability, it's not a problem for those that are coming into the marketplace at a shopability uh, lens. But when they're coming in for findability, it, and, and I'm sure we can all experience it, is that when you all of a sudden see a brand who's taken on um, a different shift in even a, a, a typeface uh, can adjust. I mean, we all just saw this with Google and um, everybody getting rid of the serif types and, and um, uh, moving to sans serif, how it, it can stun and you may actually walk straight past. And when brands spend so much um, financial investment in marketing and marketing strategy, 
the last thing you want to lose is that recognition and that loyalty that you have in your in your base and then have to go ahead and, and kind of re-market all over again. So when you follow a trend, it's great for a moment. But again, that's the whole definition of trend. It is a moment. So you have to find the sweet spot between um, figuring out how to stay nostalgic so that you have a length and a roadmap so that the brand can continue to flourish as trends grow and, and shift. And that's that's kind of a the magic of understanding your market, um, doing the proper research and the analysis, and um, and then guiding with uh, strategic design thinking of why you're choosing elements, so why you're choosing those particular colors, what does that mean um, in the psychology background, as well as um, the connection to the actual product itself. Well, very similar to that question is one from Mike Murdoch at RIT. I've been frustrated with brands that sell multiple flavors or versions with similar packaging that forced me to look very carefully. Is there a good way to think about families of colors or looks that fit together, but are still visually distinguishable? Great question. And it, it is a very challenging uh, decision for brands. And there's two answers to that from my perspective. The one is that when you are starting potentially as a new brand, that you're already thinking about what potential family expansions you may have, so that that way you're not um, building in a silo. You are not developing without the premeditative um, discussion or thought process of what potentially could we grow to and how do we ensure that there's enough distinguishable so that that exactly doesn't happen because I know it's happened to me where I'm looking for a particular flavor and um, and I make a mistake or make an error in that purchase because again remember we we start our, our decision by color. Um, the other is that we need to recognize our bias and what we have trained so this this comes back to user experience it, it, around um, the uh, preconceived building that we've done or building blocks that we've done around color. So, you know, we have uh, tested that um, and we see it out there that, you know, orange connects us to the to an orange flavor or, you know, blues connects us to blue and purples connects us to the blueberry. So we, we as a brand would not want to stray differently from what we've already taught all of our consumer bases to understand what flavor variants are just to try to be different because that generally will backfire on you. Um, so it, we, we really need to respect the psychology behind why colors are and why the choices are out there. And if you're going to be different from your competition or what's been already established, uh, you're gonna have to spend significant amount of extra effort to uh, allow your consumers to understand that. So uh, still along this line of, of, of recognition is while doing package design, how do we decide the structural design? Is it a hit and miss? trial with prototypes or sometimes because the comment then is sometimes we get carried away with the graphics part of it. We do. And that's why I should at the beginning, there's two fundamental concepts that we have to consider to build a package format. And it isn't about one having value over the other. Um, and what I try to strive and teach with my students is that technical does need to start and then graphic gets built on top of it. It's like the sandbox, right? Design and develop your sandbox first, understand your manufacturing environment, understand what your sustainability and initiatives around operations are, and then work backwards to build um, the shovel and the pail and all that on top uh, to finish that form. And actually um, it's a big challenge to design, uh, to, to graphic designers, but in all honesty, those that are, uh, are, are that are talented and have that strength can, respect the boundaries and then amplify and build success with design around that. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to the technicalities of a structure, it's significantly important to, to, to know that there are fundamental requirements to protect that product, right? And preserve the product that's within. So there are technical requirements of packaging that we can't run away from. And if you were to shift a shape um, that doesn't conform or support the product, then you're dealing with uh, quality issues, you're, you're shipping air, um, you know, again, we've got sustainability issues. So when we're so conscious in our environment currently around um, environmental considerations and mindful of materials, material usage and operations, because again, that's where we're driving uh, savings and, uh, you know, significant part of our spend, um, then we then need to kind of work backwards and uh, amplify design on top of that. 
So I hope that that helps to answer or drive where it's not about one's better than the other. It And they do end up having to um, be both equally important, um, but that they can't be designed in silo and uh, that, you know, we work technically first and then design backwards or back. I think I think Luann has presented us with a question that's going to be a, a whole new uh, webinar. She's asking, can you talk a bit more about the psychographics and color and what resources are available that can, you can recommend? Well, how about I, um, uh, maybe I can kind of share that as a, a follow-up um, that maybe can be sent to the, uh, to the attendees today. Um, but there's excellent work being done at a Clemson University. Um, around consumer purchase decision and behavior. Uh, there's also excellent uh, research that's coming out of um, Toronto Metropolitan University. I'm gonna have to get used to saying our new name. Uh, so lots of excellent work being done out of our school as well as we're starting on our own packaging stream. Um, and that's not to uh, take away anything from RIT and MIT. You guys are all doing the same. Uh, we're all doing our same uh, fundamental work around um, the packaging structures, and then also the user experience decisions around color and design. So happy to, um, to share the, the hard work that's happening. Um, and as we kind of alluded to uh, at the start of this conversation before everyone joined, um, but we're, our environments of selling are completely different and evolving as well. So at one point where we just had brick and mortar and we were purchasing, um, you know, face to face. Now we're dealing with the e-commerce, and what is that doing for um, our packaged goods and and product support when it uh, shows up at the door? How is that impacting findability and shopability and choices around uh, consumer uh, purchase behavior? So there's there's so much to research, and it's, it's an exciting field. It's not going away, and um, I'm happy to to help work on it with anybody who would like to play in the sandbox. Well, here's another information sheet you can attach to uh, your follow up. And that was, does packaging involve, package design involve research about materials, especially for food products? Check, she check, really, check. <laughs> really like <laughs> yes. it. Yes. Provide information about edible packaging. Oh, that's another interesting one too. Not in my wheelhouse, but um, but happy to see if uh, there's some insights to that. But um, obviously too, there's the other um, around design thinking and design strategies. Um, so so lots of great work that's that's out there. And um, yeah, happy to add that to my to my toolkit. Goodness, I got some takeaways. <laughs> well, I do have one question for Martin, and that is. Um, of your graduating students, what's the most common aspect of the industry that they go into? Is it advertising, retail, product development, design, uh, print management? It's all over the map, to be honest. <laughs> okay. There is, there is no, no preferred option. Okay. Well, Luann, that's the end of our questions. Do we have any more questions? Um, well, we do. Uh, we have a few more that are now coming in. Um, so Danny uh, to Reem is a, do any of the software packages you tested allow the separation um, to minimize metamerism of the color of the build color relative to the spot color? Great question. I actually don't know the answer to that, and we didn't test it. So, but this is something to uh, something really good to uh, to explore. So, um, I don't know the answer. Do you know, Martin? No, I don't remember seeing any. I don't remember. We look at this. In that we regard, to find out because eight suppliers are, have a gun to their head about main, minimizing the metamorphism of the spot colors. Yeah, that's interesting. That is a that's a question that I had asked of several of the manufacturers uh, several years ago, and they all said, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> so, you know, depending on your philosophy, I've actually made four color process matches, which minimals uh, metamorphism. You have to put it into the separation thinking before you simply just pick up an ICC CMYK that has the same XYZ or LAD. That's quite interesting. Thank you for sharing that. 
Okay, so our last question of the day is going to be uh, again from RIT. Recent research has shown that people adapt to images or lighting environments with high saturation colors, meaning that saturated colors don't as appear as impactful as they may have were they novel. Um, which, oh, is there any evidence of this in packaging? Um, have stores become too color saturated and is there a reaction to that? Um, it's a great question and certainly currently being researched as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I come from the alcohol industry and uh, we're you're constantly dealing with uh, new brands coming out, especially in the craft uh, brewing area. And, um, I, and of course, 10 times larger in the US than it is here in Canada. Um, and not only are you dealing with different lighting environments in these selling environments, but then it's a big and very important critical component for brands to understand who they're sitting beside on the shelves. Um, so for, you know, a, a brand that I was working on, which was Molson Canadian, it's brand word mark and color strength and forward color was white. Now, you know, some may say, well, that's not a color. And, um, you know, that's a that's a conversation for another day. But the but the reality is, is it stood out on shelf sitting beside the Budweiser's of the world. And then, of course, um, say a, a Labatt's blue, which its brand color was was blue. So being mindful and strategically also placing your particular product where you create that differentiation so that it allows the eye um, to shift and find um, is a key strategy. And, and then similarly, where we talk about trends, uh, there was a you know, huge trend recently around um, a lots of artisanal and you know, big imagery, not just photography, but iconography, very, very busy brands that were coming to the shelves, creating that clutter and that noise, and um, also creating challenge for, um, for individuals to shop and not feel that level of, of anxiety as trying to decide what they would purchase and to deceive the distinguishing factors between the message plus this, the, all of this imagery that was loud with lots of color. Um, so there, there certainly are uh, that research out there that's starting to, to kind of drive the question about key criteria. Um, but then you can't always predict where you're going to sit on the shelf um, and how busy you become. So, so incredible amounts of, of questions that you have to ask and uh, thinking you have to go through uh, to validate what choices you make in your package design. But please, Mike, let's talk offline. And John, you too. We've got lots to talk about. So just, just listening to you talk, I'm envious of, of all the students who get to hear you lecture in class. And I'm passing it back to Luann and Lena to wrap it up. All right. Thank you. OK, um, no more questions, right? No more questions. <laughs> okay. Not in the chat. <laughs> Lots of questions, but not in the chat. I would just say my last recap is just ensure that you understand all the factors. That's the key element. If you can continue to answer and validate all of the factors that you're going to come into play with, um, then you know, a brand is, is ahead of the game to, um, to be able to predict their environments. And so, yeah, thank you for everybody's questions and interest, because as you can tell, it's something I love. And uh, so it's great to share. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, come take the class. <laughs> Is it online? <laughs> no. Well, it was, but nope, we're going back back on campus. Well, we're going to turn that over to Lena. I just want everyone who's involved in the in the in the pre preparation of, and everyone just go ahead and turn your cameras on. We just want to give you give you all a round of applause. Thank you so much. That was Excellent. And we're got, we got a lot more to go from this. That's kind of the role of Fluorescent Fridays. It's like we start to figure out where, where people are interested and then we find the people who are working on it and we all get together. So thank you. And turning that back over to Lena. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for those lovely presentations. Uh, on behalf of the ISCC and the Fluorescent Fridays team, we would like to thank you uh, to all the speakers and to all of you for joining us today. Please to spread the word about Fluorescent Fridays and save the date for our next event, 
in October. It will be uh, the last Friday in October. If you're interested in participating, don't hesitate to contact us. We will love to hear from you. We will leave our contact information in our chat box. And thanks again and enjoy the rest of your fluorescent Friday. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Everyone. Bye.